And then, um, there you go. And then I'll turn it over to you. Welcome, Kitty Sullivan. For those of you who don't know her, she's the Managing Director of the International Emissions Trading Association. Um, she is part of uh, BCC's advisory board and has spent several years uh, around the world uh, talking about carbon markets. So for I would invite her to uh, uh, share with her thoughts and her slide deck and there'll be some time after that for for questions from the from the room. So Katie, the, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Graham. Um, just a sound check. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. And you can see my slide deck clearly. I, I can, it. yes. Excellent. Um, so thank you, Graham and Karen, Nevin, Cedric, the Biological um, Carbon Canada community, and just all of those who are on the phone today, I, uh, I, I refuse to be tone deaf about the situation that's happening right now uh, around, certainly across Canada um, and the world around COVID and how it's altered a lot of priorities and thinking and having to adapt to uh, just work and life and isolation and virtual meetings like this. So I am glad to see that this uh, event continued to happen um, and you were able to adapt it to this virtual setting. Um, I think that you know we're all feeling it directly, indirectly, what's happening with COVID and just thinking through the coming you know, months and years of the economic and you know other impacts that we'll witness again across the agriculture sector, across Canada, and globally. Um, but you know, I think that it was. I'm sure there were thoughts around. You know, is it appropriate to even pursue this event at this time? I think it's really important, though, the amount of you know critical information that will be shared today um, on the broader climate change policy and carbon market context, again, outside of Canada, certainly within Canada, um, and then diving into the thinking and engagement opportunities on the grasslands protocol and these other you know, biosync carbon market opportunities. Um, and I, I say that, because, oh, <laughs> that's not me. Cell phones on mute. Um, I say that because I, we're all aware of the fact that you know, the climate change uh, situation and tackling the challenge, uh, it's not going away, right? Uh, and we do have some very important decisions that will be made um, by both corporates and government stakeholders, uh, provincial and federal in this country on some policy and protocol design thinking and implementation over the coming months. Uh, so this is the appropriate time to get up to speed on the current uh, state of play around these carbon markets, that role of natural climate solutions, um, and uh, looking to think strategically about how to engage in these opportunities going forward. Uh, so with that, um, I, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I have, Graham was very kind. I've been running around the world for several years. Yes, a long time. <laughs> um, and certainly here at home in Canada, um, working on carbon market design, doing education and outreach and getting into the weeds also uh, on, uh, on policy in these market opportunities, both again in Canada, but also globally. Uh, I represent AIDA, which is a business uh, association based in Geneva. Uh, we have around 150 uh, companies that are uh, really representative across the, the chain, um, the value chain of carbon markets. So uh, these are large emitters, industrials, manufacturers, power sector. Um, you'll hear from two of them uh, after me with James and Denise from Capital Power and Shell. Uh, we also represent the project developers, like many of you um, are or could be in the room. Assurance providers, we represent a lot of the standards, the greenhouse gas standards like Vera and CAR um, and ACR. 
uh, the exchanges, the financials, the brokers, the whole gamut. So I think it's always imp important to, um, for any audience to appreciate where I'm coming from. It certainly is that private sector business perspective, making sure that these carbon markets work um, and don't just work in terms of their uh, effectiveness for tackling climate in a very uh, measurable way, um, but also that the environmental integrity is there um, and business has the confidence to be um, major, major players in these markets to help to uh, scale um, the uh, scale and really develop the um, low carbon solutions that we'll need in order to get to where the science tells us on climate change. Uh, so Carbon Markets 101, Karen and Graham asked me to um, really, you know, take it up a notch, get, first get back actually, but get to basics around carbon markets so we're all on the same page. I recognize there are already a lot of seasoned people on the, um, on the computer, on the phones today, um, but there's also um, many who uh, are coming up to speed on that world of, of carbon markets, offset protocols, natural climate solutions. So, I think it's vital to make sure we're all on the same page. I also appreciate there probably aren't a number of people who um, could join today's uh, webinar, but it will be available um, through recordings after. So making sure that this, um, this information and these you know, back to basic details are available for anybody who wants to uh, get up to speed quickly uh, in order to really become engaged in this space. So, Ask me to do a quick carbon market 101, um, but then I'll also get into the current landscape. So after this, the carbon market kind of evolution, um, both Canada and globally, uh, and some of the outlooks around these markets uh, and some of these key uh, jurisdictions that are, um, that are happening quite, quite quickly. And then getting into the era of enhanced ambition. So these climate change targets by countries, states, provinces and uh, also corporates, right? And major companies. So what are we seeing around that world of, you know, the enhanced um, climate ambition, these net zero targets, carbon neutrality goals. Uh, there's some really important uh, trends and opportunities that um, we see right now that will certainly speak to uh, this community around um, the uh, forage management and uh, agriculture uh, and carbon markets. Then we uh, will talk about some of the, the key roles of the NCS, um, so natural climate solutions, um, you know, the, the key options, kind of that power potential that is, um, is being unlocked, but will hopefully be increasingly unlocked over the coming years, and that role of markets. Um, and we've done some quantitative analysis with AIDA and some partners are looking at that role of markets. And then um, Karen had asked to uh, paint just that high level general picture around some of the key uh, core, I should say, criteria and elements for offset um, protocols and offset systems. Um, and this will hopefully paint the stage quite nicely um, or set the stage quite nicely for then that buyer perspective from um, Denise and James um, who are going after me. Uh, so again, carbon markets, are, like the benefit piece here is unlike, you know, other approaches to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, right, and just that whole space around decarbonization, the carbon market piece that, you know, we hold near and dear to our hearts, and certainly in this space with protocols and quantification and assurance, it's about being able to measure, you know, with confidence and rigor, um, the uh, measure the actual environmental impact, right? Um, and um, these are, you know, results-based opportunities. So it's really about that environmental goal and achieving it, but also at least cost um, by allowing for these flexible designs like trading and the use of offsets to really make sure that your climate goal is reached um, but it's done so at least cost to businesses and to consumers and to households and to um, society at large. We'll get into how this is the proven effective policy choice, not just across North America, but globally. Also with trading, um, and we're seeing it right now in the raw with COVID, right, and the impacts um, across all aspects of our economies, but how the carbon markets are allowed to, um, or really built 
to deal with macroeconomic fluctuations, right? Um, so you're seeing many prices across all commodity markets, frankly, um, you know, go down right now. Um, and carbon markets are the same thing. Uh, with the EU emissions trading system or California Quebec system, you have prices that are quite low right now. But it's quite good and critical that during these times of um, economic hardships, right, and these macro fluctuations and black swan events, that you're, you have these policy mechanisms that can actually um, respond to those in a way that will maintain, again, the environmental integrity of the system um, and uh, while uh, making sure that businesses, again, and consumers can all adapt to that um, through uh, these lower costs. Um, I won't get into the others in detail, just addressing competitiveness, providing that global response to a global challenge, spreading worldwide. It gives you that opportunity to actually link and align these markets, both intra, like within Canada, what we're seeing, but also globally, um, and that profit incentive power. And this is what is so important to, again, the community around the, the table here today. But having carbon markets, um, unlike, again, a lot of other policy options, this is what broadens the tent. It allows these new players to actually come in and be solutions providers. There's a new revenue stream, right? There's a new incentive power. So it brings in the farmers, the ranchers, foresters, and First Nations to um, be a part of the process by generating these credible offsets um, in order for use for you know, compliance or you know, voluntary purposes. Um, so uh, this is, again, more so you have it for resources, you know where to find it, but just carbon market design fundamentals, the simple version. Um, but when you look at certainly Alberta's carbon market, Canada's federal carbon market, and carbon markets globally, you, know, you have uh, scope of coverage, right? Sectors, facilities, the gases that will be covered under the program. Right, so in Canada and certainly Alberta, these larger emitters, heavy industry, these power, they have compliance obligations, right? Um, and then you have, you know, this is what drives the, the demand side of the equation. What are the caps, the intensity targets, the emission performance standards, these targets and limits. Um, and then you have a government issuing these tradable permits in Alberta, it's emissions performance credits. Um, and uh, under a cap and trade system like Quebec, it's allowances. These are tradable units, right, that can be used for compliance. Companies, participants can hold, they can sell, they can bank these permits. Um, they also, though, have the opportunity, and this is across all compliance emissions trading systems, to use offsets, right? But different programs have different, you know, shapes and flavors to their offset systems that people have to be very people, meaning participants, potential participants and proponents of offset um, projects, have to be very, uh, very uh, knowledgeable and uh, aware of what these shapes and flavors look like um, across these different offsetting programs, from voluntary programs to pre-compliance programs to certainly the compliance schemes. The takeaway here, and you know, it's really um, striking to see the challenge sometimes and people wrapping their heads around you know, carbon um, as just another commodity. It's, and, and that's where all of you deal with ag commodities, right? And you know, but carbon, it becomes just another commodity that's managed you know, in, a, in that kind of way by businesses. Hence another reason why my members, a lot of businesses like carbon to just manage it in, manage it in a compliance way, but also in a profit incentive way, right? So um, that's critical. So above all, my slide where you look at all of my members and it goes well beyond my members, businesses love offsets. They love offsets because they help keep compliance costs low. They love offsets because they re re represent these real, additional, verifiable reductions and removals. They're results-based. Um, business love offsets because of the business and market opportunities, right, and innovation that they drive. So we're big fans of if they are credible, um, legitimate offsets that are underpinned by um, good standards, right, and uh, assurance and quantification, then the more offsets, the better, because we'll need them in order to actually get to where we need to go 
on um, our decarbonization journey, but also to bring these real reductions and removals um, forward in time and accelerate um, this action earlier. Carbon market landscape. Okay, so when you look at 2007, which really wasn't that long ago, uh, this is the World Bank carbon pricing map. They have a dashboard that they update every year. Um, and so you have Europe, <laughs> um, and I should make it clear, this is both carbon taxes and cap and trade systems and intensity-based trading programs and cap and trade and with trading components. So when I go through these maps, understand this is everything under the sun for carbon pricing. But the key thing in 2007 is you look at Europe and you look at that blip in North America, obviously that's the Alberta program. So to underscore how Alberta and what was grown out of Alberta's system around carbon market design and implementation and sophistication is truly impressive and uh, continues to be one of the best in the world for, you know, across many components of its carbon market. So 2009, we start to see the BC tax, the re Reggie cap and trade system in the US. 2013, you fast forward, you see Korea, China. Um, fast forward to last year, 2019, this is the latest report. And this is where you see the surge, right? And But there are all these different flavors of carbon pricing. Um, and then, whoop, then you go to the AIDA carbon market map, okay? This is obviously a lot more frenetic um, than many other, uh, or than the World Bank resources, but this uh, highlights solely the programs, and these are, I should make it clear, compliance emissions trading systems, right, that are in design, they're actually operationalized, or they are under development. Um, and this actually doesn't even capture all of them, but you can see the surge of governments, state, provincial, and national who are moving ahead with these compliance emissions trading systems. And there are some like Colombia, for instance, or South Africa that are, their taxes, but they're, um, they allow for the use of compliance offsets in order to comply with the tax. Uh, and so that is in the snapshot of where these, uh, you know, obviously in Canada, but a lot of these other countries, dozens of them are moving ahead with these carbon market programs. All of them allow for these offset systems for compliance. So looking at the era of enhanced ambition, and if we, we go to, again, very much 50,000 foot level, the Paris agreements, or the Paris Agreement, um, 2015, well, it's a very different world right now, okay, compared to uh, Kyoto Protocol, where you had 37 countries with legally binding targets. They form the demand, right, for um, uh, international offsets under a clean development mechanism. Um, but you only had, again, these 37 uh, countries that had these targets and that were, you know, moving ahead as buyers of uh, these reductions outside of their borders. Fast forward to Paris Agreement, and it comes into force this year, 2020, um, and you have 197 countries that have all taken on climate change targets. They're nationally determined contributions, right? So they're all moving ahead with their climate targets and looking at how to actually get the amount, the number of reductions they'll need to reach these targets. And we'll talk later, but there will be a number of these countries, over a hundred of them, that are moving ahead with markets, carbon markets, and international cooperation, the trading of carbon units across international borders to help reach their climate change targets. But with all of the plans, the nationally determined contributions uh, that countries have put forward to the UN, including Canada, it is very clear that they're all most woefully insufficient. Some are more critically insufficient than others, right? And when I say insufficient, I mean insufficient that's compatible with a Paris Agreement target of two degree compatibility, right? Um, or 1.5 degree, which is what we're all trying to pursue around the Paris Agreement goal. Um, so what you have now in 2020 and going to the next UN climate negotiations in Glasgow, which have been punted to 2021, 
at some point, um, are these countries that are now starting to put forward their new, or I should say enhanced, climate change targets. Um, and Canada is working on its enhanced climate change target right now for 2030. Um, and you have all these other countries that are enhancing their current climate change targets, but also working on their mid-century net zero longer term targets. Uh, and uh, we go to, again, the role of the markets in allowing for these countries to enhance ambition, the role of natural climate solutions um, and biosyncs to enhance these climate, um, this climate ambition. And, and on top of all of these government driven uh, climate activities and enhanced ambition and net zero targets, you also have companies all over the world and from all different sectors that are putting forward their own targets, right? And their own commitments in climate action and carbon neutral pledges. Uh, so this snapshot alone, uh, you know, this looks at the percentage of Fortune Global 500 companies committed to carbon neutrality or the renewable energy 100 targets or science-based targets. And you can see that since 2015, when Paris was gaveled through, that you have um, and now, well, 2019, and this actually between December 2019 and even today in April, um, a number of other companies are taking <coughs> But this surge of these corporate commitments, right, uh, in order to, uh, to be, you know, providers and uh, key players in uh, the momentum around um, climate action. So the takeaway there is you just, you have a lot of not just the government momentum, you have a lot of corporate you know, momentum and target. So there's a ton of demand that is just gonna grow and grow for um, real and verifiable, um, these, uh, you know, uh, in, in the integrity and you know, with rigor reductions and offsets. Uh, and so, you know, this is where looking at the natural climate solutions and what those very real and ripe opportunities are around the, the biosync space are critical and uh, including to what you're doing today. So if you actually look at the natural, so the power of, of markets, just for, for context, this, uh, this slide, um, it shows the, um, the power of international carbon markets. And it actually quantifies this. It's from a study that AIDA did with the University of Maryland. And it helps to actually, you know, um, build that narrative uh, and do that education around, well, why do these markets matter so much from a climate mitigation perspective? And so this is the very high level uh, takeaways with the numbers. But what we did was we looked at if all countries were to go it alone on their climate commitments, versus if they were to allowed to actually trade, right? Based on the efficiencies and lower cost options with trading of units, carbon markets, right? Across borders that you could uh, save 250, well, 320 billion a year, right? Um, by 2030, by allowing for this trading around the world. Now, if you were to take that money and put it into uh, unlocking enhanced mitigation, you're looking at an additional nine gigatons, nine billion tons of carbon dioxide could be unlocked um, of, uh, in mitigation a year. And this whole, this land use only, look at the land use piece, right? And we are very conservative in our assumptions, but the land use piece alone, by, uh, by, um, by looking at some of the, the power of these market instruments, you're looking at an additional four gigatons, billion tons a year. Um, if land use is allowed to, to play in this space. So that NCS, the natural climate solutions, um, becomes that very key area to unlock. And so collectively, NCS can provide um, even more than a third of the reductions, you know, and the removals that we need globally to reach the Paris targets. So looking at then you parse it out right and you know, this is now getting into the discussions for today the ncs options these opportunities um, around forests right um improved forest management avoided deforestation sustainable crops wetland retention um the grasslands cropland management 
So oh, the, do you have, do you have? Uh, so the, um, so what, again, governments, um, but also businesses in the voluntary space, they already have, um, some of them, right, uh, catalogs of these existing protocols, right, in order to actually generate um, these credible uh, offset credits to help compliance entities, uh, you know, reach their compliance targets, governments reach their targets, corporate compliance reach their voluntary, you know, targets, you, me, to offset our, you know, airline emissions when we fly again. Um, so you have all of these protocols that exist or many that are under development right now. And there's a lot, I cannot emphasize it enough, a lot of attention being paid to these natural climate solution protocols and market opportunities right now. Uh, and you have um, uh, a lot of prioritization that is being dedicated to NCS uh, and these types of protocol project types, um, probably more than any other um, you know, project types happening right now. Um, again, here's just that snapshot of the corporate natural climate solutions action and commitments. This is not just from you know, government policy and demand and drivers through regulation, right? This is also through major companies making major Denise will be able to speak to Shell's story, um, but now they're trying to figure out money into their natural climate solutions. Uh, I think I've been muted. No, you're good, Katie. Oh, no, Katie, I'm, I'm just admitting other people into the so <clears throat> the webinar, and it goes like a little quiet for. Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, but, you know, keeping in mind that capital is mobile. So for instance, if we don't move in the right direction with the, you know, design of our protocols or offset systems, say under Canada's compliance offsets, you know, pro federal offsets program, um, or, you know, in Alberta or BC, they don't necessarily move in, you know, that direction that gives the businesses um, in this world that, um, that confidence that these are going to um, um, a result in you know reductions that matter, but also you know in ways that actually um, pass the sniff test across universally accepted approaches. Then the capital is mobile for these companies. They will go elsewhere because there's a lot of other you know regions and programs that are moving ahead with these NCS opportunities. Um, I'll just leave this as a stock slide for people to know, but. Um, we within AIDA, you know, we're juggling a lot of different carbon market policies um, and engagement opportunities, but we have launched the Markets for Natural Climate Solutions initiative a couple of months ago um, as one of our top initiatives globally, where you, um, where our, you know, group is looking at ensuring um, and driving these compliance NCS markets, right? Making sure there's high environmental integrity, there are co-benefits to local communities, right? Um, and um, and these, uh, there's a driven, uh, there's a driver there to by uh, a demand for these compliance obligations in the pipe. Um, I'm happy to share more about that later if anybody wants to connect offline. So my final slide, well actually no, but uh, uh, so, Karen, I know I'm a bit over time right now, um, but Karen had asked, you know, when you have these um, stakeholders, right, and certainly policymakers or, you know, uh, market participants and, and, you know, companies even <clears throat> that are, you know, looking at, well, how do we uh, ensure, right, um, that these offset credits that will be generated and we use to meet our corporate commitments or you know compliance obligations that everything is on the up, up and up right it's um there's a high level of of rigor um and assurance and so you have protocols that you know these are kind of the the stock criteria and elements um across these systems and you will be digging you know deeper into certainly the grasslands context um and the protocol later on today um, but, you know, you have the scope. So when you look at the scope, you think about project start dates for your projects, right? Um, a project must start um, on, you know, X date uh, or later. Uh, thinking about the geography, right? Is it going to be in, say, Alberta's market? You only have Alberta 
based projects, right? Um, under Canada's federal offset system, it will be Canada wide um, project activity and the GHGs targeted by offset projects typically have to be included in inventories. That's certainly the Canadian federal approach. Um, they have to be real. So greenhouse gas reductions, removals, got to be demonstrated in accordance with the a protocol, right? Um, protocol or the project has to fundamentally be equivalent to a baseline. So you'll talk about baselines later, a lot of baseline approaches. They'll include like high degrees of standardized um, elements. Um, quantifiable, right? The no-brainer follows an eligible protocol, so voluntary or compliance, to uh, quantify relevant sources, sinks, reservoirs in a very transparent, repeatable, conservative manner. Um, you have um, most voluntary and compliance offset systems, I'll say, are moving towards ISO, International Standard Organization, so ISO 14064-2. Um, principles and framework for protocol quantification, uh, monitoring, reporting requirements. You'll hear more about that, I'm sure, later today. And, you know, within these protocols, you have the requirements following um, additionality, verifiability, the whole, like, addressing leakage permanence, um, and then they must be unique, right? So avoidance of, of double counting. Um, again, getting into uh, the additionality piece, high, high level stuff. You could do two day workshop on this, um, but you have to have to have to demonstrate the project activity um, to reduce, remove GHGs, you know, goes beyond a business as usual, right? And there's approaches to doing this through performance tests, right? Um, there's uh, regulatory surplus type reviews to make sure it's additional to um, legal regulatory requirements, so not required by law. Um, you'll also have analysis of like penetration rates, barrier analyses that you'll talk about later. So additionality is uh, it's a big one um, in our space with offsets and protocols. Verifiability, you'll talk about this later, um, but there's a move now around these reductions and removals. Um, they have to be verifiable to a reasonable level of assurance. Um, and some will be, you know, um, require this to be conducted by an accredited verification body. So that would be in accordance with ISO 14064 3. Um, but the verifier, so third party verification critical, so a verifier, verification body. They have to be able to review the project info, determine whether program requirements were met, um, and then they would provide their opinion on a reasonable level of assurance. Permanence is about making sure that the potential for reversals, um, this means uh, that if a reversal occurs, when that stored, right, carbon stored, um, stored carbon uh, later released into the atmosphere, you have to take into consideration reversal risks um, in these protocols. And um, there are approaches to dealing with reversal risk, both on the policy um, side, also on different financial you know, type structures or discounts. Again, that'll be discussed later. Um, and last but not least, the unique nature of offsets. This is really important when you look at that growing surge of activity and demand for offsets and these overlapping kind of systems and requirements, right? So a voluntary, you know, the carbon markets and offset systems, protocols and registries, compliance, carbon markets and offset protocols and systems and registries, both in Canada, but also globally, right? So making sure that there's no projects that are double registered, right, um, or double credited under multiple systems, sold and used across these systems. Um, I mean, it's pretty challenging and messy right now, to put it mildly. Um, but you have a lot of uh, people, including, you know, AIDA, market experts, and certainly governments that work very, very hard to ensure there is no double counting in these programs as they mature. Final slide. No, I'm going over a bit of time, but these are the key takeaways before James and Denise uh, take it home from the buyer's perspective. Um, so I hope that I was able to communicate the story about how busy um, and shifting the carbon market landscape is, again, in Canada, but also globally. So it's so important to be aware and to act strategically and to get engaged now, though. It's not like trains left the station, right, in how to really play a big role and capitalize on opportunities in this space. 
Um, the environmental integrity, though, is so fundamental, and it's not just fundamental to policymakers. Of course, it's fundamental to them, but it's so critical to business and investors. I can't underscore it enough. They will not play ball if there's even a lick of you know, questions about the integrity and acceptance of units and transfers. And it's not just about the integrity and acceptance across our kind of nerdier or siloed carbon community. It's about the integrity and acceptance across very broad stakeholder groups. I'm talking shareholders and consumers and environmental groups and all of those that are keeping an eye on making sure that these reductions and removals that underpin these credits are legit. Clear and stable rules. What is the clear, stable compliance financial value of these units? Again, it's so important to make that very clear for planning investment purposes. Time is now, like I said, for carbon market innovation cooperation. I think in Canada and certainly in Alberta, um, and what you guys are talking about today is cutting edge stuff. And not just in Canada, but globally, um, there's a lot of hunger for some of these experiences and building blocks. Um, and finally, net zero. So when you talk about enhanced climate ambition, net zero targets, net negative targets, carbon neutral commitments, you cannot talk about this without talking about carbon markets, all right, and cooperation. And you cannot talk about this without talking about carbon sinks and removals at scale. Uh, so I hope that that has given some good scene setter remarks or stage setter remarks and food for thought to um, inform the rest of the day's discussion. I'll, I'll, I know that you will be getting more into the weeds later on, but Karen and Graham, I hope at least I did a decent uh, job with, um, again, setting the stage, but also identifying some of those core elements and criteria that you'll be delving into later with the Grasslands Protocol. Thank you. Katie, thank Thanks, you. Katie. There will be uh, time for questions uh, at the end of the three presentations, everybody. So just to uh, hold your horses, write your questions down on a scrap piece of paper somewhere, and then um, we'll open it up for, for questions after we hear from Denise and James. So Denise, if you want to be next,